Hello everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to our March's Doctor Data Science uh, session. Uh, first of all, hope everyone is working from home and everyone is healthy. Um, so today's uh, session, uh, uh, Stephen, can you uh, um, switch to next? So yeah, um, before I go there, um, we started this uh, this whole uh, new Doctor Data Science recently, and I want to make sure everyone is aware we are doing it every third Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific or 12 p.m. Eastern time. So next session will be April 15th. Um, and we are posting all this recording on YouTube as, as quick as possible. So I'm going to post the playlist on chat as well. Um, also, we started Dr. Data Science user group on LinkedIn. I'm going to post uh, that link as well in chat uh, in short while. Next slide. Right. Thanks, yeah. Um, so off we go again. This is our third Dr. Data Science session. Um, and as a reminder, the structure of it is that we do a quick little sort of nugget of information at the start, which we call our information gain session. Um, and then we have a featured session. Um, uh, and uh, last time, uh, you may recall, um, we had um, information about how you handle categorical variables. Um, and uh, we also had a featured session about how you handle text data by adding structure to text data. We call that a vector is worth a thousand words. Well, we decided to continue the punning for this uh, session, uh, our featured session today um, uh, with Venkat. Hey, Venkat, you're on the line, right? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Venkat's on the data science team as well. Uh, and he'll be presenting a picture is worth a million bytes. Kind of similar, sort of analogous to last week's, uh, last month's session where we talked about adding structure to text. Here it's about how you add structure to image data um, and then how you can apply standard machine learning methods to that. So it really is kind of analogous to what Nora did last month, but Venkat's going to be focusing on images. And yes, today our information gain is um, how we can train models on only a few positive events. It's called the sort of the rare event issue, where you're trying to build a binary classification model, um, but you only have very rare events. So a classic example of this is where you do something like fraud detection and most financial transactions, most credit card transactions are perfectly legitimate. Uh, but a very small number of fraudulent and you want to be able to predict them, you want to be able to identify them with a predictive model. Uh, and that's tough if you don't have enough data really to train your model. Um, here's another example that we worked on recently, uh, predicting mechanical failures in automobiles. Uh, in this particular case, this is actually for the demo that I produced today, it's just on a small sample of rows, uh, rows. we're just uh, uh, looking at about 160,000, 170,000 rows of which a very small fraction I think just a thousand maybe, um, um, so just a, a fraction of a percent uh, was a positive event, so a mechanical failure occurring, or in this case, as indicated by an insurance claim. Um, and so that's the problem that I'm gonna use as sort of uh, illustrating um, this, this phenomenon of uh, how to handle rare events when classification modeling. Uh, and again, the problem is, right, that our model I just can't get a hold of enough information to be able to identify what is anomalous, what is this rare event, or in this case, um, uh, looking at the historical behavior of a car from uh, sensor data that's being read off the car and sent back to the manufacturer, uh, predicting um, a claim being made because of some mechanical failure. Okay, so uh, here's an illustration of the problem, right? So I built a model here initially, it was gradient boosted trees on the original data, and it looks like a pretty good model at the top there, model accuracy of 99.33%. Um, but if you look at what the gradient boosted trees were actually doing, uh, they just predicted no all the time. They predicted zero. They predicted no claim being made. Um, and so given that 99% of the events uh, were negative, um, uh, then you get a pretty accurate model just by being kind of dumb. So um, the standard approach to doing this is to use resampling um, or a particular type of resampling called oversampling or upsampling. Um, and a particular case of that being balancing where you actually resample the data so that the number of rare events goes up. You sort of multiply up with replacement uh, to get more observations. And in the extreme version of that, you actually balance the number of cases, the number of 
uh, zeros is the same as the number of ones or the same number of trues or falses or claims made or claims not made. Um, uh, in TIBCO Data Sciences platform, you can see me here trying different models here. And over here on the, on the left where I'm doing my sampling, after I've split my sampling into training and test session, I do the resampling where I multiply up by 15 or 5 or 10 or 50 or whatever it might be uh, to adjust my number of classes. Uh, notice, by the way, that when I test my models in order to compute goodness of fit or area under the curve or confusion matrix F1 and so on, uh, I do that on the original data, not the resampled data, because that would, uh, that would uh, introduce uh, uh, false uh, good results uh, because we have all of those positive results showing up. Uh, so we want it to be on data that looks like the real world. Um, so that's sort of the idea, is just to boost up the number of positive events that we want to identify. Um, and in general, I would say from my experience that this works well, especially with ensemble methods, ensemble tree methods like random forest and gradient boosted trees. Um, uh, colleagues of mine in the past have said that this, they think SVM is particularly good for rare events. It's not something I've directly experienced, but that, that's what I'm told. It's not the case in this particular example, but I think it's very much dependent on the, on the data. Uh, maybe the most important thing to mention about this resampling technique is that it's really important to try different resampling rates. Uh, balancing in particular may, may not be good at all. So in this case, um, in general, the random forest behaved best. And if you looked over here on the x-axis, I've got the different upsampling rates. So here's what the accuracy, the overall accuracy of the model looked like on the original data. And then as I multiplied the number of positive events by two, by five, by 10, and then ultimately uh, by quite a lot to get them balanced, uh, you can see the accuracy slowly increasing and then actually decreasing. So balancing the data, same po as positive as negative, is actually not a good thing. And it looks like uh, about upsampling by a rate of 15 is about the best example. However, as always, you can't just look at overall uh, measures of accuracy. Um, if, in fact, you really want to look at recall and precision, uh, look at these confusion matrices. As you can see here, just a sort of a, a, a quick sort of visual, the random forest on the original data is really under predicting the, the ones. And here, when we do the 15 times over sampling, it looks a lot better. Um, however, you will notice that even though the recall is going up and we're getting more of these ones here, and the overall F1 score, the harmonic mean of, of these two, the recall and precision, is going up, the precision is actually going down. And that's because a lot more things are ending up in this bucket. Um, more things are being identified by as ones overall, even erroneously. So, the model is probably better depending on what I want to do with it, uh, but you do have to be careful that uh, it's, uh, it's, you don't, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and it is also a, a nice indication of why looking at these confusion matrices can be a little bit misleading. And sneak preview, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Tamash from the data science team joining us next month to talk about these types of techniques, ROC curves, uh, goodness of fit, uh, confusion matrices, and so on. But that's just a quick sneak preview of the sort of thing that can go right and go wrong. Here's a, another example. If I take the balanced sample, so 50% ones and zeros and do gradient boosted, this looks like the best confusion matrix overall. Uh, it even looks better than this one, the random forest on 15 times over sampling. However, uh, again, hidden by the confusion matrix is the fact that we're really over predicting ones. And there's actually quite a lot in here. So the precision, while the recall is really good, in fact, it's through the roof with gradient boosted trees, the precision is really, really bad. Um, which is another thing It depends on what I want to do, right? In a fraud detection, it might be okay to have lots of false positives as long as I'm getting really good recall on the fraudulent events. All I care about is identify, if I've got infinite resources to investigate them, then it can be good to get all of them. So I might actually go with my gradient boosted trees, which brings me to the final point, which is you really want to think about the cutoff point. So here, when we're looking at these confusion matrices and these uh, F1 statistics, we're looking at just um, prediction based on whether it's more than 50% confident, whether the model is more than 50% confident. But in fact, if I adjust the confidence threshold, things change quite a lot. This is for the random forest. And you notice that um, here about the 50% threshold, this is where the F1 score is uh, around here. But in fact, the best F1 score is actually to the left of that uh, at about a 30% or 40% uh, confidence threshold. So that's another thing to look at as well. So quick lesson there, I think the bottom line is that upsampling can be really good. It really depends on the model and the data. It also depends on what your goal is, um, whether you want to trap lots of events, or whether you want to be really accurate. 
Okay, so that's it for the info game. We're going to switch now over to uh, Venkat's session. Venkat's going to talk to us about processing image data. Uh, and I guess the big question here, Venkat, is how do you actually do that? <laughs> if I've been given a bunch of images that I need to, I don't know, classify or identify or understand, how do I do that? Yeah, so when we look at images, right, uh, an image is basically a set of numbers. Uh, which we call as pixels, right? And uh, it can be a color image when, in which case it'll be, it'll have three channels, R, G, B, red, blue, red, green, blue, or it'll be a grayscale image like what you're seeing on the screen. So those and, numbers represent like how gray it is basically? Yeah, correct. Got it. So if, when you have this image, right? When I look at the small portion, uh, you will see all these numbers are how gray it is. And the, the way you would load it into a computer is as an array. So you one, 170 will go to the first position, 28, 238, 85, so on. Once you reach here, then you go to the next, next row. And you will keep adding that stuff in until you get to the end. So it's 119, 221, 17, and 136. So what happens if you do have color? Is it kind of the same thing? Yeah, so it will uh, populate everything in a single array for all three channels. So uh, it'll be a uh, bigger array. I got it. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that you can do with the images. So we already spoke about how you would access color and grayscale images. And color is especially important if you, for example, you're trying to identify uh, uh, if it is a black Labrador or a, a, a golden color Labrador, right? So if you're trying to <laughs> differentiate between dogs, uh, mm -hmm. Color becomes very important. Uh, mm -hmm. Grayscale will not give us a good uh, match, right? Um, or maybe a better example would be golden and uh, a white uh, Labrador. Got it. That, uh, uh, you can also resize these images. Uh, so if, if you have uh, something which has which has a huge image, right? Uh, with these the cameras that are available today you have images that have uh, 2000 by 1900 pixels. So you can resize that into a smaller size so that it fits inside your uh, computer memory, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you click vertical pictures, sometimes horizontal pictures. If you want to make sure that you have everything in a consistent format, you, will, might, you probably want to rotate it, rotate your images. So you can do that. Uh, you can blur certain images, right? So for example, uh, the one example I've seen is, uh, when you look at Google Images, right, uh, in in Google Maps, uh, the way they don't want to show people uh, on those images, so they detect the face, and then they blur out the image so that you don't see the person in the image, uh, because that's a privacy violation. So you can, right. yeah, so you can do things like that. And then you um, mentioned video down there. So how do you handle video? So video is is just a set of images, right? This is about, if you say 60 frames per second, it's 60 images per second, right? And all the same libraries that I mentioned here, right? OpenCV, TensorFlow, PyTorch, you can use the same libraries to access mm -hmm. image data also. You can process the same images that way. And, you and can what are the differences between these libraries? Which ones are the ones you use? Are there pros? Uh, yeah, so OpenCV, I mean, you can use, uh, both of these have uh, a strong overlap but it is comes down to personal preference. I personally, when I want to just process certain images, right? I just want to use, don't want to do any machine learning. I just want to process the images. I, I'll use OpenCV. But if I want to do something like a deep neural net or something like that, I will then use TensorFlow uh, for the entire process mm -hmm. all the way through. Cool. Yeah. yeah, you can do things like classification, object tracking, uh, all of these are good use cases, uh, so sample applications for uh, use with images. I see. So I'm going to quickly flip over and show you a small demo. Um, and I'm, not, I'm going to use a, a data set known as MNIST. Uh, it's handwritten uh, digits, and I'm trying to use those images to recognize what digit it is, right? So if I, for example, look at two, uh, this is sort of my data, data set. There's about uh, uh, 60 images per uh, class, right? And you can see there's all these tools and some of them are written a little differently. So mm -hmm. I want to be able to actually identify what is a two and what is a three, what is a five. So mm -hmm. that sort of thing. 
So the first process is that you're trying to read in the data. Once you read it in, uh, there's only one parameter. You, if you want to change from grayscale to uh, color, you can just change this one parameter and it's color. You can also resize them. You can uh, normalize them when you divide by 255 because it gives you a better model. Uh, you can divide by 255. And once you read it in, uh, this is sort of your data set, right? I've read in uh, 16 to 10 classes, uh, 600 records. And there's about and it's a 28 by 28 pixel data set. Every image is 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So you'll have about 784 columns and 600 rows. And the target column is the class. So right now the first five are uh, zeros. Uh, when I look at the last ones, there's nine. Right? Oh, so that's actually the number that you're trying to identify. I got it. Correct, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you can save this data to a CSV and process it. Within, so, that's, uh, right? so you're just saying you can just take any bunch of images and just use fairly simple Python libraries to transform into nice tabular numeric data sets. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it, the libraries, the API itself are, are very uh, easy to use. So you can use those uh, uh, Python libraries to process these images. Uh, and once you bring in the CSV file into your uh, data science platform, uh, you can take this uh, data, data file, sample it into a 70-30 split, and then you can build multiple different types of uh, basic neural uh, basic neural net or machine learning models. Here you're just uh, doing exactly what you would do with any other type of classification. You're just applying standard methods to this now numeric data set. Absolutely, yes. And you can look at uh, the predicted versus, uh, so I'm going to like this, you can see the predicted versus classified, uh, ac uh, observed. So predicted versus actuals, and you can see the model accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and this sort of goes back to what Stephen was saying earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have an unbalanced data set, then this is uh, this metric doesn't give you too much information. Mm -hmm. uh, so in our case, we do have a very balanced data set. We have 60 oh. images per class. And when I look at the diagonal, I can see that it is predicting zeros really well. Three is that it's not, it's doing an okay job. Uh, sixes, ones, it's, it's able to do all these predictions really well. Uh, and even the other uh, clusters, some of these misclassifications are not that bad. There's not that many examples. Mm -hmm. So it's a 80%, close to 80% accuracy. The Alpine forest uh, on this particular data set is not doing that good a job. Uh, it's not be able to predict a bunch of classes correctly. Mm -hmm. What is surprising is that the neural net uh, is performing even worse than Alpine Forest. Yeah, we had a presentation from um, Nico on the data science team just a couple of months ago where he was talking about how neural networks are particularly good at handling this sort of unstructured image data. Interesting. Correct. Uh, that's because we're using a bunch of dense layers, fully connected layers, which is why uh, you're not doing a very good job of predicting it. What you want to use in these deep, deep neural nets is what is known as a convolutional layer. Uh, and, the, and this is something specifically for image recognition? You're saying this is a technique for image recognition? Absolutely, yes. Right. This is the technique that uh, has proven to be most successful in predicting uh, a lot of, uh, any of the models that you're seeing out there for image classification, they're using this technology in the backend. Uh, and the, a very intuitive way of explaining this is that you have a three by three matrix like this one, it's, which is called as a convolutional filter. And it is moving one step to the right and one step below. And uh, it's doing a matrix multiplication and summation and then populating this particular uh, matrix. Mm. And when you have, uh, and you can have many layers of convolutional, uh, convolutional nets, convolutional layer, many convolutional layers in your deep neural net. And in the lower layers, it is trying to identify edges, right? And once you have more deeper layers, then it is able to uh, identify higher, higher order features like eyes, noses, mouth, that sort of thing. And even deeper layers are able to identify the entire face. And once it's able to identify all of these, then you have your dense layers, which will identify uh, a class. In our case, it's zero to, 10, zero to nine. So it can identify one of those nine classes. So that, that way you can actually improve from uh, what we had about 78% accuracy was the best model. You can improve from that to about 99. 
uh, because that, that's how good this technology is in the background. So let me if I understand this. Let me see if I understand this, Venkat. Um, so you're saying you 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 have these sort of convolutional filters, right, that are good at identifying small sort of little subsections of the image and and even types of subsections like uh, I don't know. You mentioned edges, I guess, like circles or whatever it might be, or or, or sort of star shapes or or spirals or straight lines or whatever, and then. From those, you can build up to bigger features like eyes or noses or whatever that are made up of those shapes. And those can build up into bigger features like faces, which might build up into bigger features like a crowd or like a singer or you know whatever it might be. And so it's sort of like this recursive idea of building up images from smaller images from smaller images. Is that sort of getting at it? Yes, correct. That's exactly how order it is. Okay. Yeah. Cool, that's really, that's really great. So once you're able to do that, uh, you can use this technique for multiple different applications, right? Uh, one we've already seen, uh, we, we try to classify classes between zero to nine. Uh, you can classify, classify to anything, right? In this image, you're doing cat, dog, hat, and mug. Uh, in this scenario, you're essentially looking at the entire image and trying to classify it into one class. You can, Why is it always cats? That's what I wanna know. Why is it always cats? <laughs> it's <was> very popular. <laughs> Cats are popular. Okay. Sorry, go and, on. And what you can also do is if you have a particular image, you can identify what objects are available in that image. So that is what is known as object detection. So in this image, you can see cars, you can see trucks, you can see traffic lights, and you can it will show you exactly where in that image uh, you have that, uh, that object. Uh, it, these days, we are also seeing more complicated uh, use cases where uh, we're trying to train neural nets, which will look at a particular image and then try to predict what is happening in that image. Right. So in this scenario, this the person is riding a surfboard in the ocean. This was predicted. It was not something that we've written down. So you want to predict a natural language uh, caption based on the image that you're seeing. So, and people are having reasonable success uh, in, in making those predictions. Great. And finally, there's, there's still a few problems with the image data. Uh, occlusion in the sense that you, there's something blocking the object that you want to predict. Uh, you may look at the image from different angles, which is viewpoint variation. That's also a problem. Illumination is another problem because you one uh, one data uh, one image might have uh, very dark uh, uh, very dark uh, it, it might be a very dark image the other one may be uh, a very light image uh, some uh, some objects may be deformed or they may be background objects uh, in your image or within uh, in an intra class vari variation might be also a problem so think of uh, Think of if you're trying to predict between cats, right? Cats and dogs. There's the cats might be of different, different uh, colors, different, different sizes. And the model should be able to identify that as a cat. Uh, so that's also a, a problem that you need to solve when you're trying to train these models. Mm -hmm. So, um, so these are open problems, right? These are not things that people have already found solutions for yet. Uh, the only solution they found is that collect more data, uh, more good data is the only solution they have right now. I think it's the solution to everything. Um, great. Well, thanks, Venkat. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm almost surprised at how, in some ways, straightforward it is, right? There are just these standard techniques that are out there, um, standard Python libraries, standard operators in, in applications like ours, like our data science platform. And it's actually surprisingly straightforward. Hey, Ninad, um, any questions you want to ask? Yeah, so um, that is really amazing, Venkat. Um, how about the use cases? Which industry um, are using such image recognition uh, more often? So I've mainly seen uh, the use in uh, manufacturing companies, uh, or it, I've used it being used in uh, security scenarios uh, where they're trying to identify uh, potential uh, law uh, violations. Uh, and what? Sorry. No, no, it's interesting. 
yeah in in fact the most popular uh, uh, use of these uh, technologies is in uh, tesla's autopilot which uses this particular technology uh, to identify what is happening on the road uh, and then uh, make decisions based on what it has identified what these neural nets have predicted so that's that's a very and it's it's millions of people use it every day in their cars that's also a very important use case that is pretty cool uh, so yeah and um, what are some uh, atypical use of image uh, data for uh, al and ml so i i'm sort of based in new york and from what i've heard a lot of the hedge fund companies sort of look at uh, image data so they will take high resolution satellite images of areas of manufacturing plants just to make sure that they're uh, identifying the company performance in the six, next 6 months so they can either short or go short on a stock or go long on a stock so they're using for stock prediction wow. and it's <laughs> is it's being used for surveillance also uh, the resolution of these images that are taken are amazing uh, very granular and you are able to identify very very small details in those images that is very interesting so, uh,